Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. So we're talking about the Opium War again. Yay. Now it's called the First Opium War, but they didn't know there was going to be a second Opium War back yeah. then. And、uh, if you haven't listened to them, we have two previous episodes talking about this. And also, Cherry has one talking about、uh, opium use in general. Um, but we talked about kind of the precursors to it, what was going on in the Qing Dynasty, and also the sort of inciting incident where Lun Zexu seized the all the opium, all the opium, the twenty thousand chests, I think it was, of opium, and、mm-hmm. and、uh, destroyed them. So now it's a year later.、Uh, it's July eighteen forty. The British Parliament has voted to send a fleet to China to. It's not exactly clear what they're going to accomplish, but they're mad to conquer China.、Yeah. <laughs> Charles Elliot has been basically spending the last year running around,、um, hiding in various harbors, skirmishing with the Chinese <laughs> fleet,、uh, waiting for them to get there. Yeah,、uh, Charles Elliot is the plenipotentiary of trade, or the chief superintendent, whatever it is, of the East India, or、uh, previously was the East India Company, but now of the British Empire, representing all trade in.、Mm-hmm. China. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the first stage of the war where Charles Elliot is in charge、uh, up until the、uh, basically he leaves the scene. And I read some some journals and some some firsthand accounts from the British side of the people who were there and what they thought was happening. But also Cherry did a little research and read、um, essentially some、uh, hot takes from the. <laughs> From a famous、uh, Chinese scholar and historian at the time of what he thought the Opium War was about. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah.、Uh, so Wei Yuan is the scholar you were talking about, and he is.、Uh, he was born in 1794. He passed away in ni-、uh, 1857, but he lived through the First Opium War.、Mm-hmm. And、um, he. Are we getting into his his life story now? Why don't you just tell him what you, what you're going to talk about later? Oh, okay. Well, he he he. You know, he worked in the Chinese government all his life,、mm-hmm. and he wrote a lot of books. One of which、uh, was on the First Opium War. It details、uh, what had happened. It details, you know, how opium got into China. His view of how opium <laughs> got into China.、Um, it talks about Lin Zexu, what Lin Zexu has done,、mm-hmm. um, which was highly praised by him. And it talks about, you know, how we failed, why we failed, and what we gotta do. To win the Second Opium War, if there was one, which he thought was maybe gonna, there was gonna be another showdown. Yeah. Okay. Well,、so、he thought the British weren't gonna stop. He thought he, he thought this is going to be a、uh, continuously challenging situation,、mm. which is true, which was true. So yeah, so we can we can get into that after. Yeah. We can compare notes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna talk about kind of I guess the the British narrative. I hesitate to say the correct narrative, but、um, in a way that. The British are the British are the ones inciting the incident, right? True. So they they know why they think they're doing it. So in a way, the kind of timeline I think is a little bit more relevant from the British perspective. So、um, July eighteen forty. So it's been a year, more or less, a little over a year since the opium was seized, and the British fleet arrives off the coast of China with roughly fifty warships and transports. Things move slowly back in the days. They do, right? The, the, the <laughs> quickest response was a year later. The yeah, sh- the fleet arrives <laughs> well, took, to like、yeah. show you. <laughs> it, you know, it took a couple. It took a couple months to get back to、um, England, and then it took a couple months, you know, to decide, and then you got to organize the fleet.、Mm. One thing that's going to happen immediately, though, during this time period, is this is the start of when you start to have steamships, and there's going to be a couple steamships involved in this war. Gotcha. And previously. How you get back and forth from Europe to China is you have to follow the trade winds, which is like a seasonal thing. So you can only leave during certain parts of the year, and you can only return during certain parts of the year,、mm. which means you're very limited, right? I mean, it's like a ye- it's like a year's gap between when you can a round trip. So, so you're saying they got there as quickly as they could? Yes, but moving on from now,、mm-hmm. after this war ends, you know, you can get there at any time within a month or two. Yeah. Because your ships don't need wind power anymore. Yeah. Which is going to, I guess, be bad news for China because people can hassle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> people can hassle China more.、Um, so, fifty warships and transports. The entire mission falls under the command of Charles Elliot. Charles Elliot 
I hesitate to say nice guy, but he's about as nice of a guy as you could have in this position. On the scale of British ambassador Co- yeah, colonial representatives. representatives. Colonial representatives, yeah. Uh, we talked about the last episode, his previous role was protector of slaves in British Guyana. And he's kind of actually too nice for this job, as we'll get into. Hmm. Um, he's really not a good decision for the guy you want in to do a drug shakedown <laughs> <laughs> on the country. Um, but Charles Elliott... Is it a drug shakedown it's more like a you get her you better take the drug well no we'll talk about what they want okay but it yeah it's more complicated than that so so charles elliott is in charge who despite all this despite possibly blowing it and causing this whole issue by freaking out when lin zushu takes the opium Mm -hmm. and overreacting palmerston the prime minister still trusts him so he's in charge of the whole expedition okay people on the scene though aren't really happy about it. They don't really like Charles Elliott. They think that he's not really the right guy, especially because he's anti-opium and a lot of the Canton merchants are (laughs) pro-opium. Right. Trade has essentially been at a standstill and everybody is ready to get this this over with. Yeah. It's been a whole year. Um, So the first act of the fleet is to seize the island of Zolshan. It's it's Chusan in the earlier thing, but it's a big island off the coast by Ningbo, which is near modern-day Shanghai. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they seized the island, which was not that hard because, you know, the Qing Empire had no idea they were coming. Right. Even though we had a whole year. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to get into the kind of regional problems of, of China. And when, in, when on one level, it's the Qing Empire. But on the other hand, it's a bunch of different provinces with their own cultures who don't really care about each other. There were factions. Yes. So they get there and they tell the Chinese fleet. Fleet is a strong word, but the Chinese ships that were there, like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna take the island, and the Chinese fleet's like, like, why are you bothering us? Like, why don't you go bother the people in Canton? Yeah. We have nothing to do with this. Yeah, you know, we don't even like the Cantonese people, right? Because this yeah. is miles up, you know, this is hundreds of miles up the coast. Mm-hmm. But um, they thought this was one Chinese military. Yes, but not really. Yes, not yeah. really. The British vessels destroy them, and then they capture the island. Okay. Most most of the Chinese population on the island fled in prepara- in while this was occurring because they had no idea what the British were going to do to them. And to be fair, the British soldiers in China, or, you know, people yeah. in China, they were very uh, unpredictable <laughs> yeah. in terms of, you know, the crimes they might commit, and they were acting, they were, they were, they were walking around acting as if the law didn't apply to them, yeah. which it didn't. Well, yeah. it's, it's interesting because, you know... We're gonna, we'll talk about it a bit, but it's like soldiers are going to be soldiers. And this is going to be something that's from, you know, ancient Greece or ancient China to today. Yeah. And when you have lots of young armed men and probably later women with, with weapons and in a country where they don't, they're going to do bad stuff. You mean they're going to commit war crimes? They're going to commit, well, not necessarily. Well, modern, in a modern sense. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? There's going to be thefts. There's going to be rapes. There's going to be murders. Yeah. Soldiers um, will be, that's the first time I've heard that. It's basically the, the version for a military, the boys will be boys for yeah. the military. But I mean, it, it just is, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, they're just, historically, that's just what happens in yeah. all situations. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why wars aren't good. <laughs> they, they, work. No, wars aren't <laughs> Wars good. are not good? Wars are not good. So, Damn. I don't really. So they capture the island, okay, and they're going to hold that for most of the campaign and ho- hold it as a bargaining chip. Okay. Like, we'll give it back to you if you do what we want. Um, but other than that, its primary role is going to be almost like all the British soldiers there are going to catch diseases, and a lot of them are going to die mm. uh, while they sit on this island. That accomplished, the parts of the fleet broke off to blockade various rivers and ports, while the main force went north to attempt to meet with the emperor, which is um, more difficult than it might seem. Um, the force arrived and anchored off the White River, which leads to Beijing. Yeah. This is the same route both earlier and friendlier British expeditions had used the uh, McCartney and the Amherst expedition to try and talk to the emperor. They seem to still haven't gotten it yet. Or maybe they think this time will be different because <laughs> we're, 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 we're invading. Yeah. So he's got to meet us now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, to, to, have, a war, to have a war, both sides need to agree that they're at war, yeah, which is exactly. you're gonna, we're going to find is rather difficult. Yeah. Um, the British think they're at war. The Qing Empire, <laughs> I don't they're know. They're like, we're taking the island. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're on your soil. 
Yeah. It's not a war. And the Chin government, let me guess, was well, like, ah, it's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> We're so, just going to pretend it's not happening. Well, so they arrive. They anchor okay. off. Um, and Elliot gives a letter to uh, Keyshawn, who's the um, local official. Okay. Governor general of the area who forwards it to the emperor. And the emperor reads it. And because um, he doesn't really understand what's going on. He knows that trade has been messed up. You know, he knows Lin Zushu's down there and they stopped the opium. He but, sent Lin Zushu down there to stop I, the opium. I, I know, but he doesn't really understand that they're at war. Oh, right. Okay. So he's like, well, what, what, what do they want? Like, I hear that, you know, they took this island. Like, w- what's going on here? So he I'm re- sorry, just not to disrupt your rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean they took the island and he didn't understand they were at war? Why else would they take an island? Well, to have a peaceful relationship, you know, I mean, I, I just, I'm just saying that sounds like a party line. Well, okay. So, I mean, the, the British, you got to understand, like the British have not been very consistent in their dealings with China either. Mm. And that multiple times they've gone and they've blown up forts and they've done things, you know, they tried to take Macau multiple times. And so from the emperor's perspective, he might just think, oh, they're just causing trouble again. Right. They want something, you know what I mean? Or, you know, they're maybe they took this island and then they're going to leave after a little bit. We'll take it back. Like he doesn't really understand what's happening. OK. Right. Um, and the emperor is not a child. I'm like, no, no at I think, times I think he's like 30. During I, Qing I think he's like 30 yeah. or 40. Yeah. OK. So uh, his initial reaction when he read the letter, which basically the letter said, this is why we're upset. <laughs> this is what we're mad about. This is our like hurt feelings report. Mm-hmm. Lin Zixia took the opium, you know, like he imprisoned us there. We're unhappy about it, all these other things. And um, the emperor is like, oh, okay, this is all Lin Zixia's fault. <laughs> so he's like, okay. He like, basically he said, tell the British, we'll fire Lin Zixia. Yeah. And everything goes back to normal. Yeah. So that's what he did. So <laughs> Lin was fired. Yeah. Kishan the guy who was in Tianjin that who took the letter yeah replaced him okay and so Kishan's like okay hey Elliot you know I get there's some other stuff you want you know you want this like six million dollars and all these other things but let's go talk about it down in Canton because that's where this happened right and we'll, we'll talk about it there and really this is a way to just buy time because you know it's gonna take Kishan like three months to get down to Canton mm. maybe he thinks maybe they'll just get tired and go home Right, right. He was delaying. <laughs> yeah, just keep yeah. delaying it. Keep delaying it. Although he was almost delaying the uh, inevitable. Yeah, but you know, they don't know that, right? They okay. think. They think. Yeah, you know what? I think. I think. Uh, am I just brainwashed by this? <laughs> by this nationalism of like a strong, <laughs> the need for a strong central government? Maybe I'll, I'll keep an open mind. Yeah. Well, so you know. Um, so basically, yeah, to think like maybe, you know, tempers are cool. Mm-hmm. We'll sort this out. Right. And also, if it's down in Canton and they're negotiating, there's stuff that he could agree to that the emperor won't like. Mm. And maybe the emperor won't find out about it. <laughs> OK, so, so he understood what it was like to be a Chinese bureaucrat. Well, he'd made it that far. Time, he was yeah. governor general of the, the area around Beijing. So, yeah. you know, um, so in, so now it's late um, 1941. So it's you know, um, or I'm sorry, um, late 1940. Mm. So this is another six months after they arrive. Um, and so now they're in Canton, Elliot's with his fleet, and they're discussing. And one of the things I think probably that the Chinese or the Qing Empire hoped would happen, I got to be careful about saying Chinese versus Qing Empire, because as we're going to talk about, they're very much not the same thing, Yeah, is that the British wouldn't be able to find supplies. But the problem is, is everybody in Canton is quite happy to sell the British fleet right. supplies. Right. So they have no problems getting supplies. Mm-hmm. They can sit out there as long as they want. There is a distinction. The, the British Empire is very careful to say that our war is against the Qing. And the, the British understand that the Manchurians, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Qing court, is not the same as Han Chinese. Mm. And they view that as a potential wedge. Right. That... You know, we can use that to, to, to break up China. Right. Right. And either form it into different states or maybe we get a puppet, uh, a puppet Han Chinese dynasty back on the throne. Mm. Um, that's what uh, Napier wanted, who was the guy before Elliot mm. when, he, when he started his like stupid war with China. Right. He thought like, oh, 
they'll rebel. They'll put a, like a, what is it? A Ming dynasty back, on, to the, <laughs> back yeah. on the throne and they'll be our friends. Yeah. The loyalty of civilians in various areas could vary greatly. Um, with some resisting the British and others welcoming them for the resumption of trade and, and commerce. Hmm. So you'll see, like, uh, in Canton, the population is not very anti-British. They're, oh, I'm sure, yeah. Because they're, they're all making money from them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's all, a lot of them speak English. Yeah. Or they speak a little English, right? But they can talk with them. They trade with them. Other parts of the country, like, eventually when the fleet's going to go back up north... They've never mm. seen yeah, a British so person much. and they're like, we're going to get killed. They're yeah. going to eat us. Right. Like, and yeah. you know, so there is a difference. Okay. So it's been now almost two years since this, op- since the situation started, the fleet's been there for six months. Uh, Charles Elliott says, okay, I've had enough. Keyshawn keeps delaying, right? He keeps saying, oh, these requests look interesting, Elliot, but I got to ask the emperor. It takes three months to get there and three <laughs> months to get back. So just so give every me a little... time you, Every time I got to ask a question, it takes yeah. six months. Yeah. yeah. So give me a little bit of time, right? Uh, I got to go speak to my manager. So, <laughs> so Charles Elliot goes, okay, I've had enough. Hmm. Most of the other people in the military people involved are like, you should have done this from day one. You should have just started blowing stuff up and don't stop blowing stuff up until they give us the treaty we want, right? Right. Just every day, just blow more stuff up. But, you know, so Charles Elliott's like, okay, fine. After six months, we got to do something. Mm. So he decided to start destroying the series of forts leading up to Canton. On paper, these forts were quite powerful, and local officials had expanded them at great expense after Napier's attacks in 1833. Mm. So Canton is up the canal, the river a little bit. And um, there's all sorts of forts on either side of the banks. There's islands in the middle with, with forts on them, right. with cannons. And um, on between the forts and across the river, it's full of either chains or rafts that are chained together. So the idea is, is that, you know, any ship that goes up, the current is, is coming against you, so it's hard to get up there anyway. You can't get past the chain and while you're stuck in the river, you know, the whole way up, all the forts are going to be shooting at you with cannons. Mm. So there was a line of defense that was built. Yes. And and I'll, I'm going to talk about the descriptions of it. But and the line of defense was ultimately successful in 1833 with Napier. OK, because Napier was, you know, I talked about in the previous episode, but he basically threw a temper tantrum and he was in the Canton factories and he basically told his gunships, which were, I think, two frigates, come get me. Mm. And they couldn't because they went up. They got in a battle with the first series of forts. Um, they got damaged. And then there was all these chains and other stuff ahead. And they were just like, well, we can't, we can't, can't get, get to get you. Up there. Right. You know, Napier had to surrender. And then he died of malaria. So it's not an ineffective system. Uh, these powerful forts consider... Then this is from... I forget his name. I'm going to put it in the comments, but this is from the journal of one of the officers who was there on the expedition. Okay. Uh, These powerful forts consisted of a new and well-built granite battery forming two-thirds of a segment of a circle and partly surrounding the old fort of Anghui. This fort mounted 42 guns, four of which were Portuguese brass 68-pounders purchased from the Macau authorities two years since. The remainder were of Chinese construction with an immense made of metal in them and all of a large caliber. In a line from the northern end of the fort and facing the river was a straight work mounting 60 heavy pieces, about 150 yards of rocky beach, and between it, a circular fort mounting 40 guns. Um, opposite to Ong Hoi and about three quarters of a mile distant to it is North Wang Tong, which probably is pronounced something completely different today. Um, equally strongly fortified and mounting 163 pieces, while a chain extending from the southernmost or new fort to the island of South Wang Tong. And then he even talks about um, another fort um, named by the Chinese after the late Lord Napier, it having been erected by them to commemorate the discomfiture and death of that lamented nobleman. <laughs> Many guns bore inscriptions alluding to the events of the time. Okay. So that's a small, you know, there's, there's like 20 or 30 forts of various sizes all the way up. Okay. And they're full of cannons. So it sounds very elaborate. It's very elaborate and they spent a lot of money on it. But there's two problems with these forts. Okay. Um, one is they don't have any protection against land attacks, or they have very little protection against land attacks. Mm. They're all set up with walls all facing the, the water. The water, and So it's only for ships. Yes. And so basically the British just land troops and they march up from behind or the sides and they just blow up the forts. Right. 
And also they don't really have the ability to engage modern warships. One weakness of the, all these fancy Chinese cannons, which they have a bunch of, some of them are very old. They find some cannons that were dates of like, you know, the 1600s. Oh, wow. Okay. And interestingly, some of them have crosses on them and stuff because one of the things that Chinese emperors would do with their pet Christian missionaries <laughs> is, make, <laughs> is make them forge cannons for them. Right. So, you know, they're like some some priest made one 150 years ago. Um, That's very Christian-like Yeah. for them. Of them, yeah. So they don't... The problem with the guns is they're, they don't... They can't point downward enough to engage a lot of ships. Okay. They're like fixed. They're just bolted onto something. Or they have bad powder. The powder, the gunpowder is not of a good quality. Mm. Or some of the cannons are just so old that they just like explode when you shoot them. <laughs> and, you know... Okay. And actually, this is going to be an ongoing problem with, with Qing China because... Um, gunpowder quality because that's what's going to lose them the war against japan and you know what years. we and one of the things we even said what he that said we gotta do oh, what do you do we gotta buy gunpowder <laughs> <laughs> like we gotta purchase gunpowders from foreign countries and merchants and i was thinking didn't we invent <laughs> <laughs> isn't that one of the big four chinese inventions <laughs> yeah why <laughs> you know but yeah that makes sense now so anyway the other part the other problem is is that very recently steamships and military steamships have come on the scene mm. and these are pretty crude but what we think of steamships they're like the paddle wheel kind with the big wheels on the side mm. like they go up like the, the mississippi river or something okay. that kind of invalidates the whole concept of the chinese the Qing defense system because they can just sail up the river if even if the river is going the other way mm. and that also means they can do things like go up and like throw a rope around the, the Chinese chains going across the river and like yank them out. <laughs> right. They can like, you know, hook onto stuff and yank them out. And, and what they'll do is they only have four, but they'll take like all the other little boats mm -hmm. and they'll tow them behind them up the river. Ah, so at one okay. point, the, the Nemesis, which is the flagship, will have 30 boats being towed behind it. So it's just like towing the whole fleet up the river. Right. Which the, was very useful. To, yeah, very to useful. Them, and, yeah. The, and the Qing didn't really account for. So interesting. So basically technology or well, western technology yeah has developed in a pretty short amount of time that what worked for napier like yeah. what was used for against napier's attacks were yeah. quickly just pretty useless sounds like against all these new methods and new steamships and yeah and we'll talk about some of the other kind of british technological advantages but beyond the ships the British don't have that much of an advantage in technology. Mm, okay. um, the ships are a big one. And actually the Nemesis, which is a very intimidating name, which <laughs> is Elliot's flagship, yeah. is the first iron-hulled military steamship. I know it's ah. the first British one, okay. but um, and it was actually made by the East India Company for a situation like this. Mm. It, uh, it's fast. It's, yeah, it's got an iron hull, so a lot of guns can't hurt it. And also it's a very shallow uh, draft. So there's lots of like little mud banks and things under the surface that the, uh, you know, that the Qing defenders thought would stop a ship. Like it'll get stuck in the mud, mm. but it would just float over them. Okay. Um, so that obviously changes a lot. So, so the first wave of forts has seized, you know, um, the, the Chinese, the, the Qing defense is pretty heavy. Um, I think it's partially because A, it's the first round. And again, these soldiers think they're all going to get killed if they lose. Right. But it's a pretty bad defense. Like I said, the gunpowder doesn't really work well. The forts aren't well organized. A lot of the troops don't know how the weapons, the Qing troops don't know how their weapons work. Mm. Cannons aren't good. And um, the Chinese mandarins, you know, the Chinese officials who are put in charge of these units have no idea what they're doing. Right. right. They're, they're not, we, we talked about it in the prequel, but the kind of hard bitten Manchurian you know, step uh, military <laughs> minds, yeah, military minds. They're all like, you know, in their set, they're either dead or they're like in their seventies or eighties. Right? right. Um, so none of these people have ever really fought a war or know what they're doing. There's no equivalent of the West point. No, in China. no military <laughs> academies. Yeah. yeah. I guess you read some Confucius and that's what you do. You, you read the art of war, war. You don't read Confucius. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually a big thing. I'll, I'll talk about now because it's like the, the Chinese, uh, troops have swords and and spears and stuff, but they also okay. have guns. Right, as you said, China invented gunpowder, and they have what are called matchlocks, which is you've probably seen pictures of. But you know, they're the kind where you have a little burning piece of rope, mm -hmm. and that's what sets off the gunpowder. Oh, okay. Um, 
And that's sort of the oldest type of firearm. Mm. After that, most of the British troops have flintlocks, which are the things where you have a piece of flint and it hits a piece of metal and that makes sparks mm. and that sets off the gunpowder. And those are better because they, you know, the, the, it can't be blown out. Um, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's less of a chance that you'll accidentally set something on fire. Mm. It's a better system. Okay. And the most modern British troops, who are mostly East India Company troops, so these will be like, um, they're called sepoys, which are Indian soldiers led by British officers. Mm -hmm. They have percussion caps, which is closer to what we have as, as modern things, where it's just a piece of metal with some stuff in it that goes off when you hit it. Okay. This is how modern bullets work. Okay. Um, they're still all muzzle loading. You still got to have the ramrod and push the bullet down the end of the gun. But it's just, it's, it's advances. But they're not like astronomically better. Um, the main advantage the British have is just that they're they're more experienced at this. They have officers. They're that know organized. What they're, they're organized. They know what they're doing. They have drill. Their weapons work. Their gunpowder works. And while there's theoretically a lot more Qing troops, it doesn't matter how many troops you have if they're all in forts all over the place. And every time the British attack, they can land three thousand guys. Right. Because if you know the fort has one, you know, so the the same three thousand guys are just landing everywhere and taking all these forts. Um, right. The so, same three thousand guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and they will take all of them. They will go to the next one. Yeah, and they'll take all of them. They'll go to the next one. And and the the British reports are interesting because the the people that they that they write badly about mm -hmm. are the, the the Mandarin officials, the Manchu officials. Okay. They're basically they have a lot of bad things to say about them, and in a sort of a backhanded compliment, they they'll versus to whom the, the, the troops the troops okay. they they think like oh these these people are 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 brave they're trying to fight us mm. but like they're just so incompetently led and supplied that they can't right. they, they can't really resist us right and in a backhanded compliment one of them says you know if they were properly trained and equipped they would be the equal of our sepoys which are their <laughs> their indian troops right? right right which you know so not the equal of our british <laughs> no, i mean let's, troops, but... let's not get ahead of ourselves right. um but, you know, that's their way of saying, like, but, oh. But they did feel like the Chinese side, the, yeah. the Qing government side, has the... Uh, I'm just going to say the Chinese. Like, they were the government at this time. Yeah. Uh, you know, but they, um, they, they lack leadership. They lack leadership right. and logistics and tactics, gotcha. right? Okay. And it's like, it's like a systematic problem. It's not a problem of the Chinese race. I no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, now, so they, they take some forts. Mm -hmm. And Keyshawn's like, okay, okay, let's talk. Let's talk. So they, send, <laughs> they, send, they send a negotiator. Okay. So Elliot had a list of demands from Palmerston, the prime minister, about what to ask for. Uh, these were quite extensive. And Palmerston's like, look, it's expensive to send this fleet. It took a lot of political capital to get everybody to agree to do it. We don't know when we're going to get to do this again. So let's just get everything we can ask for. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I'll go over the demands, but a lot of these are very similar to what McCartney asked for in 1793 mm. for, for nothing, <laughs> right. you know, like he wanted an island, he wanted Hong Kong, he wanted all this stuff. So the British are still asking for all this stuff. Right. Um, but this time there's some guns behind it. So Palmerston's like, you got to get payment for the opium that Lindsay Shu burned because otherwise, we're, or he melted kind of in acid, but we, otherwise he you know, destroyed. We're, we're going to pay yeah. for it. Yeah. We got to get money for sending these this fleet here you got to pay for our war you got to pay for our war i was gonna say, that was a joke huh pay but, for the wall like oh, mexico is gonna yeah. pay for the wall yeah <laughs> we're gonna make a we're gonna have a war and make china pay for it yeah um one or more islands uh-huh hong kong is basically the one they wanted mm -hmm. more ports open for trade along I, I thought they wanted a different island and they didn't want hong kong but they gave them hong kong thinking it was nothing well, they actually they want accurate? Hong Kong oh, okay. because they it's it's a really good port. Okay. And the 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 British want a place a little bit away from the mainland mm. where they can kind of control and th they can have a port where they can sit during storms. Okay. And so I think they they think Hong Kong is a good choice. Okay. Uh, they want more ports open for trade with rights of residence for men and women, so they can bring their wives, which uh -huh. was a a big sticking point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no wives allowed policy. No wives allowed policy. Uh, an end to the Hong merchant monopoly so they can trade with anyone. Mm. And extraterritoriality for British subjects in trading ports, which is going to be the, you know. Mm. An extraterritoriality means that um, if a British person commits a crime, 
then um, the British, they're subject to British authority. So like yeah. the Chinese people could arrest them, but then they have to give them to the British and say like, oh, he murdered somebody. And right. then the British have to do the trial, which is, you know, obviously a big ask. And specifically, he wanted the demands, Palmerston, one of the demands presented bluntly and directly as if negotiating with another European nation, mm. which is not going to go over well, right? Because that's not no. how you ask the emperor for something, right? No. Palmerston's like, just, t- just give the emperor this. So there's several problems with this plan. The first is that only the emperor has the authority to sign off on concessions <laughs> like this. Yeah. For mere money, something can be done. And we're going to talk about that. But uh, the extraterritoriality, the trade and territorial changes would surely make their way back to him. Yeah. The second is that no Chinese official is going to present these demands to the emperor as is. As, as if they want to lose their head yeah. right away. <laughs> yeah. So they're not going to just say like, yeah, this is what they want. Um, they're going to hint at it. They're going to say, ah, well, maybe we can give him an island. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're not going to just say like, we got to give him this stuff or they're going to keep blowing stuff up. Yeah. Dao Gong, who's the emperor at the time, mm-hmm. has a very unrealistic view of why this war is happening mm. and what they wanted. And even when he does learn of demands, his advisors the entire time present him with a very rosy view of how the war was going. Mm. So he thinks, well, why would I give them this stuff? If, if things are going well yeah, for me. <laughs> if we're, win- we're winning, right? Yeah, right. So last is, is that Charles Elliott is not the right kind of guy for this job. Why? Because he, he's too soft? He does not want to incur the long-term hatred of the Chinese people. He thinks uh. like, we want a long relationship with China. Why don't we just have something where we both can kind of be happy about it and right. we can kind of be friends. We can have a win-win situation. Well, yeah, that's what Charles said. <laughs> he's looking for a win-win situation, right? <laughs> So he makes up his own settlement that he thinks is fair. Okay. Okay. The other British people are like, you're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And this is not like, it's not like he's a Chinese official. He's going to lose his head for doing this. No, he just, he's a representative of the government. He more or less thinks that a Palmerston's demands are unrealistic, Mm. which it's not his, really his job to decide that. Right. And B, he thinks it's not fair. Right. To the Chinese people. But it's, wait, let me ask this because, you know, like you said that the Chinese side, yeah. there is no, I, you know, idea of like, I'm the representative of this government. Yeah. What I sign is going to be what this government agrees to. Yes. But does Charles Elliott he has have the power. this? He, he does have this power yeah. more or less. Yeah, he, okay. he has the power to say the war is over essentially, right? right? He's supposed to represent yes. the, uh, the Palmer. But yeah. if, 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 if that's the negotiation results he got, then that's what England got. Yes, more okay. or less. And I mean, obviously, they can always start another war. Right. You know, but yeah, if they're too <laughs> but, unhappy about it. But, but yeah. yes, but he has the authority to do this. So people grumble. But it's like, right. so, so he thinks, OK, I want six million dollars for the opium, which is probably less than what the opium was worth. I think it was something like 20 million dollars of opium or something like that is what it actually was worth. Oh, that's like less than a third. Yeah. So okay. it's, I, I forget the exact numbers and it's, you know, it's but significantly less. It's not, they're going to lose money on this whole deal, especially okay. sending the, the fleet over and all that, right? Okay. So he wants Hong Kong as a second trading port. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's still going to be China. You can have duties and taxes on it and all that stuff. It's and, China and, now. Yeah. So yeah, so basically he wanted it to be like I a second. I can't get any jokes into that. Okay, what's well, what's the joke? Give me the <laughs> Hong joke. Hong Kong's Chinese now. It's, it's, you know, it's more than a hundred, many years later. They got it back. They got it back. Yeah. Fully. <laughs> Unfortunately. Bad joke, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but they wanted Hong Kong to be a second Macau. Okay. Where people could live and the trading port and all that, right? right? And then they wanted he wanted trade to reopen. So this is a pretty good deal, right? This is a pretty good deal for... Um, for China? For the Qin Emperor? Yeah, to, to get out of the deal. And also, Kishan was going to work it so that the Hong merchants paid the six million. <laughs> so the emperor right. kind of doesn't even have to find out about it. Right. Right. All, the only he thing will he, find the money elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing he really has to get the emperor to sign off on is turn Hong Kong into a separate second Macau. Right. And because the emperor. Which wants, we've done once already. Yeah. We already have one Macau. Yeah. Right. right? So like, what, what's a, what's a second island? Yeah. So Keyshawn says to Elliot deal. But then the emperor's like, no deal. <laughs> <laughs> the emperor's like, I'm not giving what, him. Three Hong months K- later, the emperor goes More no or deal. less. Well, okay. it was quicker than that. But basically it's like, no, mm-hmm. I'm not doing this. Right. So all he could really do is continue to delay Charles Elliott because the emperor is like, well, you're winning. Just just win the war. Right. right? Just, <laughs> and then Charles Elliott's like, hey, what did the emperor say about my deal? 
<laughs> right? So Keyshawn's like, oh my God, like what am I, you know what I mean? What am I supposed to do here? I want to keep my head. Yeah. I want to, <laughs> I want his words. So he delays. Yeah. He's, what he, do I do? He, he makes feasts for Elliot. You know, okay. he's like, oh, come over. Well, you know, we'll have a party. Okay. And um, it's funny. One of these big feasts they have outside the walls of Canton and the emperor finds out and he asks him about it. And he's like, oh, well, I just happened to see Elliot, Charles Elliot out there. We had lunch. Like, <laughs> not like we had this gigantic feast for him to try and get him to, to chill out. Right. So, okay. It's been over a month now. Okay. Back and forth. Uh, Elliot decides, okay, we got we to gotta blow more stuff up. Um, however, at that point, Keyshawn's been replaced as well. <laughs> Partly because of our old friend Lin Zushu, mm-hmm. who's still around, even right. though he got fired. And he's like, you know... I think actually the only reason these barbarians are blowing stuff up is because it's Keyshawn's fault. Because mm-hmm. I I took the opium, I was firm, yeah. and nobody did anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> and now and Keyshawn comes in, jo- <laughs> yeah, playing soft, playing nice. Yeah, Keyshawn came in and screwed it up. Yeah, they're so, just stepping all over him. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Keyshawn's out now too. Okay, so who's in? Who's back in? <laughs> the emperor's cousin Yishan. Oh. <laughs> okay, and. Uh, and that's the kind of governor. And the general uh-huh. is going to be this guy named Yang Fang, okay. who is an older Manchurian type general. Okay. But he's he's 70. He's turning, I think, 71 right. this the year of the thing. So he's his best days are behind him. Right. <laughs> so and obviously the 70 year old guy has no clue of the capabilities of the British or a modern army or anything like that. Okay. So now he's in charge. So almost more. Yeah, probably Conf- worse. Confused and uh, not sure about what's going on. Yes, yeah. and we'll, we'll talk, but he's he's completely incompetent. So uh, on the 25th of February, the British attacked again. To, of which year? Uh, 1940, or 1841. Okay. So um, pr- this is now progressively weaker resistance as more and more troops will just run away. And right. the, the, Manchu, the Manchu officers are starting to just lock people in the forts. Oh, my God. They lock the door behind them and then they run away. Um, to try and keep them fighting. God, okay. A lot of, again, the, the, the Chinese troops, you know, they'll either fight to the death or they'll kill themselves because they have no idea what's going to happen if they get captured. Right, they don't want to get tortured. They don't yeah. Wanna, yeah. And a lot of them aren't from this area. China's a big place. You're marching, they're starting to march in troops from all over. Mm. Theoretically, on paper, the Qing Empire had close to a million troops. Gee, wow, okay. But... And the, the British force is like 5,000 guys, right. five to 10,000, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously that's on paper, mm. right? And as we've seen recently in Afghanistan, paper soldiers don't fight very well. No. Um, so the actual number is going to be smaller. Oh, let's sneak that one in. No, it's good. Was it? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so they're all kind of, but they're all, there's people streaming in. Yeah. And uh, casualties continue to be light for the British, aside from disease. Um, only one British soldier had died so far from the enemy. Mm, okay. I mean, probably several thousand Qing troops had died at this point. Though three British soldiers had died from their own weapons, which I just want to read this one account. From their own weapons? Yes. This is talking about the Modeste, which I think is one of the steamships. Okay. The Modeste had two men badly wounded after landing. This is when they're taking a fort. And one man killed himself in the act of taking his percussion musket out of the boat. The hammer being down caught the thwart, which is part of the boat. And the piece discharged itself, the ball passing through the poor fellow's head. So it's basically like, you know, his gun went off accidentally. He knocked it against the boat and he blew his head off. Um, <laughs> Jesus, okay. And that was, and apparently that happened three, three different times in similar situations. Uh, a soldier, Which seems unlikely. You know, but... <laughs> well, you know, so, you know, uh, some of these troops might not have been. They might have just been like naval guys that they right, okay. put on a boat and said, take that fort. Okay. The British have a lot of injured, though, which I think is, I think you can look at because I think really most of the Chinese guns did not work. Mm. And so when you have a lot of injuries and no deaths, I think it's because the, the Chinese, the Qing troops are fighting them with like swords and spears and stuff. Uh. So dudes are getting cut, but not like killed. Right. Um, I mean, you know. So it's not even we're fighting like not Stone Age, but we're fighting a you like know. a like a Three Kingdoms yeah Three Kingdoms <laughs> war again you know yeah y- using using Three Kingdoms times uh but weapons against modern um, yeah there's a um there's a part also here where like um this guy the officer writing it they're taking some fort and um a, a Chinese guy runs at him with a matchlock. Oh. And the, the the Chinese guy's matchlock doesn't fire. Right. But then the British guy takes out his pistol and it doesn't fire. And then the Chinese guy just 
throws the gun at him and runs, <laughs> and runs, away. <laughs> and runs away and they right. both kind of go on with their lives um so all wars back in the day yeah exactly yeah um so and yang fang he has these really weird solutions he's like oh we're gonna take all of the chamber pots of all the women and put them on rafts and float them down towards the british and like it's gonna do some feng shui type, feng shui type stuff <laughs> The woman? The woman are going to do some feng shui No, stuff? like all of the chamber pots. Okay. You know, the things you poop in. Okay. We're going to put them on rafts and okay. we're going to float them down towards the British fleet. Oh, where did I he- hear the, the word woman from? Well, it's going to be the women's chamber pots. Oh, okay. Which I guess is separate from the men's chamber pots. And that has a different feng shui than the and men's gonna, chamber It's okay. going to do some sort of mystical thing. Okay. It's going to do something. And there's also all these things of like, oh, we're going to import these guys from like whatever province and they can breathe underwater. And they're going to, like, walk under the river and, like, drill holes in the British boats. So, like, like the Taiping Rebellion when people can, like, break up... Or break Boxer up Rebellion. A bro- a bo- sorry. Yeah. Boxer Rebellion. Well, like, yeah. It, so, so it's all myth. And- it's, it's that kind of stuff now. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, we're at that point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We're at that point. And all they're right. still fighting. Yeah. Right. But it's, like... Because there are still forts and stuff, but it's, like... Th- those are Yang Fang's, like, big ideas. Right. right? That's the kind of stuff you So things do. get pretty weird. Things are getting pretty weird <laughs> at this point. Um, so Elliot and his fleet um, then make their way back finally to the Canton factories where this all started. Mm. They seize control. They put the flag back up and essentially immediately trade resumes, even though they're <laughs> okay. at war. Right. So like the, the, the Chinese ships will be coming down the river. The Qing troops will be shooting at them. They'll right. just ignore them. Right. <laughs> they'll, they'll drop off their tea or get whatever. And right. then they'll just go back up the river and the Qing troops are still shooting at them. Mm. Because the money is worth it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they have and that's what I mean by the difference between like the Qing Empire and China. Mm-hmm. These people have no real loyalty no. to the Qing Empire. The only thing the only loyalty they have is fear, essentially. Yeah. But I mean also it's their livelihood. Yeah, it's their it's livelihood. Their, they need know? the money. Um, so basically trade has started again, unofficially, but also kind of officially. <laughs> um, de facto it was starting Yeah, de again. facto. And the new generals come and they lie to the emperor. They say everything's going great. Who and- doesn't lie to the emperor? Lin Zexu, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but then he, yeah. Lin Zexu, he said, I'm going to get rid of this opium. And he got rid of the opium. Yeah. And he was right. And, and uh, the emperor got rid of him. So <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out for him. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, more troops keep flooding the area. Mm. And basically, it means you almost have, like, miniature civil wars breaking out all over the area. Right. Because it's like, oh, there's these guys from, I don't know, Sichuan. And now there's guys from Hunan. And there's guys from, you know, wherever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, none of them like each other. Right. Right. And, and you know, they'll be like, oh, those, those people from Hunan, like, they eat babies or something. Right. And, you know, like, so there's all this sort of weird regional mistrust. Right. And these are different provinces and regions of China. Yeah, different regions and provinces of China. Yeah. And none of these people have ever met each other or know anything about each other. They might even have slightly different dialogues, like, you know, different... Yeah, dialects it, and... Of Chinese, but, you know, yeah. No, I, I can imagine that. Yeah. So it's complete chaos. And, so um, we're going to soon get into the Three Kingdoms <laughs> period <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If no one gets a hold of this situation. Um, and Yishan, who's the guy who replaced Kishan, confusingly... Um, his first assessment is like, this is hopeless. He's right. the political guy. Yang Fang is the military guy. Okay. And he's like, this is hopeless. Everyone in this entire area of Canton profits off the foreigners. Yeah. They all speak English. Yeah. And they, they have no desire to resist them. Right. So there was a couple attempts by the Qing troops to do things like counterattacks. Okay. Make, they'd do fire ships. You know, they'd have like rafts with flammable stuff on them and try and float them into the british fleet that's or like the, some three kingdoms shit yeah. yeah i mean fire ships are uh they do work but okay you know like the, the nemesis is made of iron so right. you're not going to really get that on fire with a, with a fire ship right. um you know they'll have uh like rafts with guys on them with swords and try and like oh we'll float up to the enemy ship in the middle of the night and we'll like assassin them ass- yeah kill everybody okay. but you know it assassinate them yeah. yeah it doesn't work and this pisses Elliot off because at, at the same time, and this pisses everybody off because at the same time, Kishan, Yishan, whoever, mm-hmm. you know, is like, oh, we just need a little bit more time. But, you know, I think the emperor is going to agree. They can like look down the river and they could see the Chinese building new forts. Right. You know, so and, clearly like, they're not. and like dragging cannons out of the old forts and putting them in the new forts. Right. So it's like, okay, well, clearly they have no intention of, they're, of yeah, accepting. Yeah, they're preparing to fight again. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so continues to fight. They decide to uh, just take Canton. They're like, you know what? We're going to just blow up Canton mm. and then we'll see what they do. So he pushes the city of Canton. They have to um, drag um, cannons onto all the hills around the city because it's walled and they just start bombarding it, mm. which causes, again, total chaos. Right. You know, half of the foreign troops that they've brought in start looting the city. Right, everybody starts running away. Soldiers will be soldiers. Soldiers like will you be said. soldiers, uh, and everybody's fleeing. Mm. Um, and then finally, in a last ditch deal to save the city, they agree, like, okay, we'll pay you six million dollars cash right now, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you won't burn down the city. And then Charles Elliott goes, fine, but the war is still on. I'm just not <laughs> going to burn down Canton. Right. And uh, all of the, the, the non-Cantonese troops have to leave the city mm. and they have to be 60 miles out mm. and they cannot leave with banners or music, <laughs> which is, you know, in this time period, right. you know, maybe Elliot thought that was real, real insulting. Um, but that was a thing actually back in this time period, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you were allowed to leave with your flags, it, you could not. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, what is, what is the military without the morale of, you know? Yeah. So Elliot's troops were outraged. Yeah. Everybody was real pissed off. Everybody was writing back to England. They're pissed off. Mm -hmm. All the accounts, everybody's pissed off because it's like, oh. At Elliot? Yeah. Because oh, they're okay. like, okay, this is like the seventh time they've done this. Right. <laughs> where they've stalled the time. Right. We could have looted Canton. Right. Would have been great. We would have made a load of money. Well, yeah. Right. Canton's a rich city at yeah, this point. Yeah, right. Yeah. And instead, just the, the Chinese troops looted it for us. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, now we got to wait around here for another year for Charles Elliot, the nice guy to, to play know. nice again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So the British troops take this opportunity. Now there's this temporary peace to do a little casual looting uh, of this countryside, mm. you know, riding around and, you know, they're breaking open tombs and uh, bringing back souvenirs. And this is Whoa, the, that's a atrocity. The, yes. Yeah. And Cultural well, atrocity. Have you been to the British Museum? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. So as they do. So it's in character for them. Yeah. They're, they're breaking open graves and stuff. And um, this thing happened that's called the San Yuan Li incident. Okay. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. As these troops were doing this, all the local villages who essentially had no part in the actual war got upset. Well, yeah. Because, you know, so now it's affecting them. Yeah. And they basically form a bunch of militias and they start fighting the British troops in the area. And there's a, at the height, there's like 20 to 40,000 of these guys mm. within a day or two all arrive. Right. <laughs> High population density right. <laughs> um, in China, right? And um, I mean, pretty good uh, grassroots uh, organizational powers too, though. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Considering these people were not in the military or... No. Yeah, they're just... They're just I guess citizens. But everybody's a, everybody's got swords and pikes hidden under their floorboards of their right. house, right? Right. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wait. So uh, if I may ask, the um, you know the digging of the graves. Yeah. I mean, obviously, in Chinese or Eastern culture, that's very disrespectful, and it's almost like the highest you know pun uh, level of punishment well, or or humiliation. Yeah. Is it not the case in at this point? I guess British culture. Yeah, but they're not. You know, <laughs> right? So they say no. So it's not like it's not something humiliating no. for them. They no. knew it they're was a bad like, thing oh, to do. This is what you do, right? right. You know, we're curious. We'll we just could, because yeah, so we therefore could. we're gonna yeah. do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, like they they'd have parties where you would they would dissect mummies, right? You would bring a mummy. Oh, you true. You know, not so, even the mummies get respect. No. Yeah. So like, you know. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're keeping up with the uh, the party line here. Yeah. The British are the bad people. <laughs> And the most, the, the high point of this whole incident is there's maybe like, I don't know if that's a company, so maybe like 150 British troops um, get caught out in the rain and they have the older style muskets, which, ah, can't, so it's not gonna work. which can't fire in the rain. Hmm. And um, the, um, the angry villagers basically surround them all night and hmm. stab them with spears, which, hmm. which are longer than their bayonets. And eventually <laughs> uh, they have to get rescued by some troops. I think it was actually Indian troops who have the, the newer type of musket. Mm. Um, and uh, the end result, though, is that the, the Qing officials, they hear about it and they're like, knock it off. Yeah, because, to the local, local, to like, the local people, people because yeah. they're worried it's going to jeopardize the, the truce. Um, 
but the and apparently this is a this is an event that gets brought up a lot in like um, CCP modern Chinese propaganda. Yeah, I'm sure about the opium war. But it does really show that like it's not that the people in the area were in, are incapable of fighting for their own interest. Yeah, it's just that fighting and dying for the Qing Empire is not in their. Well, own. fighting for the trade is not in their interest. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Fighting against the trade is not in their interest, and also fighting for the the Qing Empire is also not in their interest, right? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, fighting against the trade. Yeah, fighting against the trade. Yeah, fighting to stop the trade. Yeah. But I mean, if you really piss them off by, which is again an atrocity everywhere. Yeah. Any time in history of times, which is dig some dig their ancestors' graves, <laughs> they are going to get pissed off. And yeah. Fight. Yeah. And I think it's particular. Well, we're gonna get into this. If I think we're gonna do an up, upcoming episode on the Judge D books. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I'm really excited that we're gonna do that episode. Yeah. Way. And they go into it more, but I mean, there is this kind of sense of, I think more so than like like in Christian theology. Yeah. Dead people can't influence the, the, the current world. This in the Chinese conception in mm-hmm. this period, it's almost like your ancestors give you a stat bonus in this world. Mm-hmm. And they that bless if, you. Yeah, they bless you. And yeah. if your ancestors are praised and taken care of, yeah. you, know, you give them hell money. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's just Chinese. I mean, a, a lot of Eastern uh, yeah, Asian culture lot, Japan, have that same concept. Yeah, have the yeah. Yeah, but so it's 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 not just the that dead is the takes the higher place. Yes. Yeah. So it's not just that they're disrespecting you. Yeah. It's that they're actively Dis- harming you. Harming you. Yeah. Right. Because if they destroy all the graves and all this stuff, then you your ancestors can no longer right help you out. Yeah. Right? So in their mind, it's also a very effective way to, I guess. Lower your, <laughs> lower your chances, and yeah. in a in a in a row of a of a game like a, it's like a you know it's like an RPG. Game. Oh yes, it's a, you take a row and you know yeah, the ancestors give you penalty. bonus. Yeah. So yeah, so they're they're very unhappy about this. The end result mm-hmm. is that Charles Elliot essentially shortly after this gets replaced, and obviously the replacement was probably decided a, before the the treaty. I don't know the exact timeline, mm-hmm. but basically people have been writing back and they go. Charles Elliott, he, he's not the right guy for this. He's too soft. Right. He actually believes the, the Chinese officials when they say they need time to negotiate. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we need, like, essentially an asshole right. to come down here and finish this war. So who was the asshole they sent? Uh, well, they, this guy named Henry Pottinger, okay. who we're going we're gonna to talk, talk about. Talk about the next episode. But he's basically going to go back up north and just start burning cities on his way to Nanjing. And eventually, rather than let Nanjing get burned down, which mm-hmm. is... Probably the second largest city. All the Jinx, all the, yeah, all, all, the, the Jinx. all the important, like, yeah, yeah the southern capital, capital cities. Yeah. yeah it, rather than let the southern capital get destroyed, eventually they kind of, they kind of deal the, right. the, the, the Qing Empire. But um, uh, Charles Elliott uh, gets shipwrecked right. before he gets replaced. There's mm-hmm. a typhoon, there's a storm, he gets shipwrecked, and he gets found by local Cantonese people. <laughs> okay. And there's a huge, humongous bounty on his head uh, okay. from the emperor. Okay, of course. But the, the Cantonese people, the people who rescue him, he's like, you know, all I got is 3000 bucks. And I think the emperor's bounty was like a hundred or $150,000. Mm. And they're like, okay, sure. And they take him back to the British. Mm. And even when they get stopped by a, a Qing warship, they hide him under stuff and they just lie. And they go, oh, no, we're just like carrying some rice or something. Interesting. Why did they do that? I think it's because of a couple of things. I think it's like, A, they know the British are just going to pay them. Right? right. They know that, you know what I mean? <laughs> you will get the money. You, you'll get the money and it's going to be no complication. And they're right? not going to kill you because you send them back. Like that's not a... Y- yeah, yeah, right. And it's like, you just, it's just no frills. You get the money. They're easy to deal with. Yeah. Um, and it's like... You're not going to meet the emperor. Yeah, who knows yeah. if you're going <laughs> to get the money from the emperor, right? Yeah. yeah. And also, I think in some ways, this sort of validates Charles Elliott's strategy. Uh-huh. Because it's like he was careful to only go after military targets. Right. He didn't want to burn down cities. He didn't want to piss off the people. He didn't want to piss off the people. Well, you need to trade with the people. Yeah. Yeah. And even like when they took back the factories, mm-hmm. all of the stuff in the warehouses and stuff, all of the the items, mm-hmm. you know, he was like, oh, well, that's still Chinese property. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, you got to pay the Hong merchants, whoever, for that stuff. Mm-hmm. Which again, people write in the journals, it's like, well, like that's our stuff now. We, we we've conquered it essentially. <laughs> right. And then Charles Elliott's like, no, no, no. We got to follow that's the interesting. rules. Interesting. Yeah. And I think partially because of that, like the local people in the area did not have a beef with Charles Elliott. They right. knew who he was, mm. and they just brought him back and got their got their cash. Mm. 
Well, that saved his life then. That's interesting. It's almost like Charles Elliot is what, like, the British Empire at this point yeah. wants the world to believe. <laughs> yeah. Like like what they do, it's yeah. on the up and up. You know, they're they're saviors and they're you know. Yeah. Um, they just want the world to be a better place. Yeah, you know, but and and but, he's he's a good choice for maybe for the peacetime yeah. commission. But like he's not the right choice for the guy you wanted to come in and be an asshole. And well, he's not the right choice for expanding the British Empire. <laughs> no, not the expansion part, anyways. Maybe no, the maintaining part. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, but that speaks to the truth of the. You know, so he uh, Charles Elliot, then he was relieved mm-hmm. and he went back to become an, an official in another strange and violent land. Oh, where? The Republic of Texas. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's lived a life. Yeah, so this is the brief period when um, Texas was an independent republic. Right. And the British wanted it to stay independent because mm. they thought that it, the United well, States is going to get yeah. is going to get too powerful. Yeah. So they sent Charles. Oh, they were right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they sent Charles Elliot there. So he was like the pro consul or some sort of person. Wait, but it didn't work. He no, didn't stop. That, no, eventually. United States becoming united. No, they got annexed, so he went back to the UK. I don't know what he did after that. Um, <laughs> so Yishan, for his part, uh-huh. he spun the agreement as a victory, with the six million silver being a trifling sum to be paid by the Hong merchants. Hmm. He's like, don't worry about it, Emperor. You know, we'll, we'll cover it. You know. <laughs> okay. Um, what he did not make clear, though, is that the peace only applied to the Canton area. Okay. And that with a new commander, the British are going to be continuing the war. Okay. So basically, the emperor at this point thought it's all good. We figured it out. Trades back up. Mm. And we got to pay them some money or something. But whatever. Right, let's just pretend everything's normal again. And- Crisis averted. Yeah. And he's going to be real surprised. <laughs> that it's not. When it's not. Yeah. Um, and Yishan's going to get, gonna get, <laughs> get in trouble. But mm. uh but yeah, so that's where we're at now. And then okay. I think we'll do one more episode. We're going to talk about the kind of end the stages. The rest of the war. Yeah. yeah. All right. Wait so that's, that's what essentially the British thought was happening. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. So what did. What did uh, so let's, let's talk about William, the person. First, okay. The scholar first. So he, um, he came from, from what I can tell, not a very significant background. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say like, I can't find like he was like a, a quote unquote peasant, but he didn't come from like a traditional Mm. um prestigious family either so he passed the imperial exam when he was young and got the juren degree which is a pretty you know like the entry-level degree Mm -hmm. and he worked for the Qing government basically for a very long time he moved around um at one point he was in charge of editing the royal classics uh, selection (laughs) book (laughs) which was um just a collection of official government documents articles reviews um in all aspects of governing which was good training for him and then he worked in canal transportation management and water management. Um, and then he wrote a bunch of articles about those topics. So he really is a lifelong bureaucrat, bureaucrat administrator, scholar yeah. of the government, right? And even military strategist <laughs> later on because, you know, or maybe self-appointed <laughs> uh, armchair, for that. Armchair strategist. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, he's a scholar uh, first and foremost. Yeah. That's where he started. Um and his most famous work is not the book we're going to talk about today, which is about the Opium War, mm-hmm. uh, specifically about the Opium War. But uh, but the most famous work of him is called the Illustrated Treatise on the Maritime Kingdoms, mm. 海国图志, which was based on a lot of translated material um, and research under the order of no other Lin Zexu. He's good buddy. <laughs> They're good buddies. So, um, and a lot of other materials. Yeah. But it's I, basically... I it's, feel like Lin Zexu comes out of this mm-hmm. all right. Like, I think um, because he was... Well, his reputation definitely comes out of yeah, it all right. Yeah, because he wasn't around for when, when it all went to hell. Yeah. He kind of, yeah. you know, doesn't get uh, as bad of a rap. Yes. And what he did, in a way, ages well. <laughs> yeah. In the narrative of nationalism it, and history, right? Yeah. So... Um, so in the, in the Hai Guo Tu Zhi, in the books, well, yeah, I wanted to say the book, but really it was, it's very long. It's, you know, a collection of books. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically the first significant and elaborate effort to document the West from mm-hmm. a Chinese perspective in Chinese language. Um, you know, it lists information in terms of geography, history, political systems, Western technology. It's got maps, you know, all the maps he could collect. Um, of Europe, 
of America, and it talks about religion and international relationships, culture, education systems, all that. So this is a so guy like an encyclopedia who, as much as they could about the West. So this is a guy who's academically mm -hmm. interested in the West. Yes, right, hundred percent curious about it. Yeah, and um, you know the fam there's a famous Chinese phrase "shi yi chang ji yi zhi yi," which is still gets used, I think, a lot today. Um, which is almost like an idiom at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it came from this book. What's the phrase? It's mean? translated to oh. learn from the advanced technologies of the West in order to conquer slash resist the West. Mm. In order to deal with the West is the yeah. direct translation. But they were they really mean, you know. Um, and, you know, th this idea was very influential at the time. Of course, has its limits because it's not all about the technology. Yeah. As you, you know, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Um, but anyway, so the book that he wrote about the Opium War is called Dao Guang Yang Sou Zheng Fu Ji. Um, and to be noted, or th okay, the name directly translates to, and there are different versions of the name mm -hmm. for, a, for a reason, which I'll, we'll get into in a second. Um, but the, the, the name, the, the sort of official name translates to Dao Guang is the name of the emperor at the mm -hmm. time. Yang so meaning foreign like ships. Zheng Fu Ji meaning like the you know the conquering uh, trip mm -hmm. up to China. So this book was not credited. So like the foreign raid during the emperor's time or something. Yeah, during like, this time because mm -hmm. in China we're, we're still just like maybe like Japan. Japan still still right <laughs> yeah. like like the the year you are you're the first year of the emperor is the first year that you it's the, is it, you will say that nineteen. I don't know. This year is year one of Dao Guang, which is the name of the emperor. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was not credit, credited at first when the book went into circulation. When I, and when I say in circulation, not published because it wasn't printed. Because we did print books at the time. Yeah. Like his other books were printed, the, the official you know, sort of efforts. Um, but this book um, was handwritten, copied. And there were different versions, various versions of it mm. went around. And um, but today, it's generally believed that he wrote the book. Okay. So it's not an official account by the imperial government. It's an official. It's an account by him. It's his. And blog, people think it's his blog post. Yeah, exactly. And people <laughs> think it's because it was such a sensitive topic at the time. And this was written while it was all happening. Yeah. Um, when was it written? Like 1942. I mean, it, or three? it went into circulation basically near the end of the Opium War. So before, or it was shortly even... after. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, so, and then it got edited multiple times. Again, there are different versions of it, but it, the book, you know, rec records of like, you know, what Ling Zexu did and all that. So clearly it happened afterwards, mm -hmm. after the, you know, after all these events, but it was very soon, you know, um, so, so people thought, you know, maybe it was, it was not a good thing to put your name on it. Yeah. Or you're still a government official, <laughs> um, might get into, get, get you into some troubles. Anyhow, so, um, so he was... A scholar, but in 1841, during the First Opium War, he went to Zhejiang province to work as a military strategist. Okay. Almost the front line, close to the front line <laughs> of all, you know, what was happening, where the action was. So during that time, he had questioned a captured captain, Peter Anstruther of the Madras Ar Artillery, which was the division of the British India Army. Yeah, East India Company Army. Yeah. So um, he then, after the, the questioning, he wrote an article called Short Notes of English, of England, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, was evidence, used by evidence, as an evidence that he knew about England. But he was an expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's probably <laughs> as close as they've got. I know, right? So relatively, comparatively speaking, yeah. um, you know, he knew a lot more than what the usual Chinese bureaucrats bureaucrats did well, at the, the time the, the funny thing is about this is like there's people in canton like the hong merchants and they're like actively investing in mm -hmm. american and european companies yeah overseas so like there are people oh there are who really do know but that but, doesn't but necessarily talking, we're talking about chinese bureaucrats yeah, it doesn't filter up into the <laughs> yeah into the bureaucrats so um yeah and you know he's questioning it was he like it was translated by translators mm. and if you actually read the article it's some of it is the accuracy is kind of questionable. Okay. Um, and, you know, maybe there's, if you are an expert on this subject, please feel free to write up to us, our listeners, because I was got really confused, but I couldn't find any direct, you know, like discussion or research on it. Like, it, it, for example, in that article about you know, short notes of England, mm -hmm. um, he wrote about how, like, the name Morrison yeah. is not a person's name, but a position's name, because there are many Morrisons. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you will see multiple Morrisons at multiple locations of China. Like, 
Westerners who are called Morrisons. Yeah. So like it's not, but like, clearly it's a last name. Yeah, I think. And I couldn't a- find any evidence <laughs> that Morrison, because I'm like, well, maybe I don't know. You know, English. I, I don't know. It's not my first language. Maybe Morrison is a job name. But it's not. I couldn't find any evidence that it is. <laughs> no. And I think it's just more, many people who, who have their last name Morrison. Yeah. But that was his conclusion, which, you know, again, take it with a grain of salt. I think it was documented to the best of his ability. I mean, there is there is stuff like that in English, like people who are named Smith or Cooper. It's because yeah, right. their ancestors had certain jobs, maybe. But like, you know. But this yeah. was the 18, yeah, like no. 40. Yeah. <laughs> and again, Morrison's not a Smith. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. you can't extend it to be a blacksmith or yeah. or anything like that. Anyways, so about the, the, the opium book, the opium war book he wrote. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, what does he think? Well, you want you want me to read it and like give you the gist of it, yeah. right? Like, a what did he think caused it? Yeah. yeah. Or AKA whose fault it was. So, first and foremost, <laughs> it was England. <laughs> <laughs> he said this uh, opium came from England, which is not true. And also, like the Chinese word he used was this smoke, like s- s- supposedly the smoking of the opium. Yeah. Came from England, mm. which was by all evidence not true. We did invent it. You know, we were good at enjoying the. <laughs> yeah, you know, refining the art of and enjoying opium, and it's been in China in small amounts for for a long time, of years, yeah. right? So he says that this came from England. Um, you know, it, it was sold by British merchants. Yeah, that's though, true. Right, like although the material came from India, Turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's take you know, let's just say maybe he meant that partial truth. They dumped it into China, yeah. which was true. Mm-hmm. Um, then he said the Westerners, which was not specific, but presumably he meant the Westerners from England. Um, banned their citizens from opium intaking, which is also not true. <laughs> <laughs> but that was what he wrote, and which is uh, a very popular na- narrative even today. Yeah, that you will see it get you know inaccurately. That's in Lin Zushi's referenced. famous letter to Queen Victoria. Yes, where he's like, "You've banned this," and a lot of times that's printed with no context mm-hmm. and yeah. implies that it was banned in England. But, exactly, but yeah. it wasn't. Well, it was banned at a much later, I think 19, uh, like sorry, seven, 18, like 18, 1868, mm-hmm. where they banned it for like medical use only, yeah. which is, you know, so this was not true. Um, and then, and then he also said, if someone in England, um, a, a British citizen, dares to take opium, the punishment was to shoot them into the ocean using a <laughs> cannon, <laughs> which was like, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're going to hang the person on the, you know, on the end of the, the cannon pipe, with well, the tube, and then shoot them into the ocean? Well, they actually did do that in India as, for, as punishment. They did? Where they would strap somebody to the front of a cannon. Oh, my and then, God. And then they'd, like, blow their chest out. They'd, like, strap them, like, with their arms, and then they'd, they'd yeah. Okay, I'm up. actually shocked right now. <laughs> yeah. My imagination was too limited. I know that, I know that like, the Indian princes would do that, but I, I think, actually, the, the, the East India Company had done that before too okay punishment. so that was a form of punishment maybe not for opium yeah okay they so didn't like shoot them out of the cannon they strapped them to the cannon was, and they okay. shoot the cannon gotcha well he said that you'll shoot them and they will sink in the ocean okay. so I, you know and then anyways then he continues to say um you know england only targets other countries meaning china um and seduces them with opium so as to use up their wealth and to, so to use so to use up their wealth and weaken their people mm. which was I think this was more true because you yeah. know it. the The purpose was to um, get the silver. Get the silver. There was a trade deficit. That yeah. was literally the point, right? The weaken the people. I guess is just a side effect. <laughs> yeah, just a collateral. <laughs> so, anyways, he then describes that opium addiction for China was worse than the damages done by quote fierce floods and savage beasts quote. <laughs> so basically, he thought it was a great sc- sc- scourge, right? And, I just um, wonder what, how much of a problem savage beasts were in right. China at this point. I, that was a Chinese phrase for, like, it's almost an idiom for like... Barbarians or something? For, or no, bandit? for like Asian times, like the, the, the oh. worst, like, you know, the worst okay. um, scourge okay. there could be. So he says then, we have to fix this as quickly as possible with the bang. And he suggested, that with the bang was what I added. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the spirit that he was trying mm. to, uh, to, you know, to say. So he suggested... The punishment by death if someone cannot quit smoking with opium within one year. Hmm. That was Lin Zishu's plan too, basically. Hmm. Yeah. Well, he, he and Lin Zishu really see eye to eye. <laughs> Lin Zishu did nothing wrong. A hundred percent. We're going to get into that. Uh, so why did China do so badly? First, well, in England, that yeah. was the cause. But why did China, in response, you know, 
you know had had gone through all these troubles and and did not do well in, in this war. conflict. Yeah. Uh, first internally, well, not not only in the war, but also like how did China got hooked on opium? Oh, okay. So internally, it was corruption. Mm. China. Uh, so he he rec- recorded like Chinese officials and patrol boats would as- accept bribes and let the opium in when it was getting banned. This was before Lin Zexu. This was at the starting ages, right? Starting yeah. time when opium started getting dumped into China. So, um, so you know, and then he said there were all these campaigns um, of banning opium and confiscating opium before Lin Zexu. But really, often it was just used as a threat to ask for more bribery. Which is true. Which was true. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like when he gets to the internal stuff, he he actually did understand it quite well. Mm. It was a clear, you know, um, mind. His eyes were yeah. clouded. Yeah, unclouded. <laughs> Un- unclouded. Yeah. Um. So and then he said, and you know, it, it, he goes on and on about the military details uh, and also all this process. So throughout, um, the whole thing, starting with um when opium started become a problem in China. There were eight key points, turn, <laughs> eight key turning points during which China could have a recognized the seriousness of the situation, b prevented it from happening in the first place, c turned the war around. Mm. So, and it, this goes into like the whole. So when he says war, yeah. he means it almost like the war on drugs. He's not saying it's the war started in no, 1840. No, no, he, no. He he's saying like this war on opium, which well, began. Well, this war on opium, but he also talks about the military oh, okay. efforts between. In his narrative, it's all this connected. was all connected, mm. which I think is true as well. Yeah, probably. Right. So, but this, you know, the, the eight key po- turning points. Yeah. Again, well, goes, we talked about just... this many times. Chinese people, we love to name things like with like we have to have a number on it. <laughs> the eight generals or something. Yeah, or the, the eight generals. The seven legendary beasts. Yes. Well, I want to say really quick. So, like, his view of it. Mm-hmm. There's the um, There's the art of war by Sun Tzu. But there's also the art of war by Clausewitz, who was a Prussian strategist. And he okay. has the famous quote, this, it, which is actually around this time period. And he has the famous quote, which he says, war is the continuation of politics by other means, mm. which is basically like it's a continuum. Yeah. War is not separate from politics. Yeah. It's just another tool in the toolbox. Yeah. And I feel like the opium war is like the perfect example of that yeah right it's mm-hmm. just like a continuum and then they're sliding a little war in there to sweet to, to, to get what they want and yes. i feel like it's it's very fair of um uh, he, he, um, yeah. him making this just uh judgment yeah, yeah. no i agree so I, I feel like when you get to this part of the book it gets better mm-hmm. but um but then he also the, the, his analysis of it the first of the eight key turning points was uh the when the eastern india company lost their monopoly okay and the british government took over right essentially which in, we talked about yeah. and which we talked about and he was like the the company is gone so there is no one in charge and that's good for us <laughs> which i i think that's very debatable because <laughs> it's just chaos right and yeah. we talked about in the first the prequel of the opium yeah. war it was not good and then he <laughs> said and then he said this guangzhou governor who just got into position the governor lucian um He's new. He doesn't know anything about it. He just listened to the Western merchants. They got his year and he wrote to England and asked for a representative of the British government, which is not what happened. No. The, 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 the Guangzhou governor could not ask, demand. No. You know, um, they could say like, oh, do I have anyone to talk to? Yeah. But they can't make England send a representative. I mean, Napier just kind of showed up and he's like, hey, yeah. I'm the guy. And it started essentially a small war. Right. So. Yeah. So but he was like, this is his fault. They could have been in chaos. They had no leading, like leading sheep. Okay. And he asked for one. And it's like, I don't know. So anyway, so I agree on the chaos part, though. I agree on the chaos part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if the chaos is good or bad, though. I don't know if it was a problem. It was a problem that needed to be solved. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but he was like, we could use the chaos. Mm. But he was not like, this chaos needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, the eight key turning points. It was his opinion. Yeah. Not necessarily accurate. Not even the Let's historical facts that he, you know. And then he said, we basically joined the war during the military conflict. We don't have a good fighting strategy, which was also true. We, he said, we fought at the wrong time. We tried to defend the wrong location. We didn't spend money on what should have been, what we should have spent on. And we spent money on what we shouldn't have spent okay. on. Okay. Spend money on the wrong places. And um, so he was very much condemning the war effort. Okay. And um, how we're going to fix it is basically, in short, what Lin Zexu did. <laughs> He's like, 
he detailed what industry did. Uh, he detailed the process of, you know, like, uh, here's how many um, shipments of opium we have, and here's how many he burned, and all that, and uh, all positive words mm-hmm. of Lin Zexu's campaign. And he even wrote about when Lin Zexu was destroying the opium at the port, um, an audience of foreign merchants watched, and they were so impressed. <laughs> and they wrote articles to record the event and praise the Chinese government, which there were records of foreign maybe not the merchants who got directly yeah. affected. They were like, oh, wow, the Chinese government is actually doing it at this time, yeah. which would be a shock, which I believe. Um, and then he said that you have to fight it, basically this whole imperial effort of England, mm-hmm. and you have to fight it smart. But more importantly, you have to put your foot down. You have and to be he, firm. Yeah. And he mu- he's very much not um, leaning towards the soft effort or like, let's just pretend it's not happening yeah. or let's play nice. So he criticized the officials, the Chinese officials and generals at the time um, who were in favor of surrendering or just pretending it's not happening, which was a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And um, and he you know, criticized the ones that he thought were corrupt. And he didn't like the uh, Daoguang emperor uh, was being too inci- indecisive, although the, if the emperor was being given wrong information. Yeah. Um, well, the but, emperor did do a thing where he would tell people to go down and do something, and then they would either do it, or and he would then blame them for doing that. Well, if, it turned out, <laughs> if it turned out badly, right. which is what happened to Lin Zixu. Right. So he wasn't directly criticizing it, but he very much implied that he was like, the emperor was too indecisive. Yeah. That was bad. And um, too much back and forth. And he didn't like how the emperor... Um, treated Lin Zexu <laughs> afterwards, mm-hmm. um, and um, and you know the emperor. He felt like the emperor was swayed by the weak ones mm. <laughs> of the ranks in what the ranks. Po- what point are we on now? Uh, what do you mean? That's the, how we're we gonna fix it? Oh, but what point of eight? Oh no, I I only I only talked about the first point of eight. Oh, it's too much to detail. Oh, and they're not okay. all right. Like oh, that's why okay. I just, that was an example of oh one of the points of one of the points that was okay. not right. <laughs> yeah, okay. it was not accurate. Okay. So this is how, this is, this is, this, this is, he th- goes on to how we're going to fix it. Okay. Solutions. Solutions are like identifying problems and solutions. Mm. So some of this might have been the key t- turning point. Yeah. Like we shouldn't play nice. Um, but um, in general, um, he was like, we should just do what Lindsay did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he also praised the people's self-organized efforts to fight the British. Which is probably the San... Yuanli incident uh, and multiple many and many others right yeah. you said so so he liked that and um you know he's he also proposed for the future that you have to spend money on fixing the infrastructure you have to spend money on the navy building up the chinese navy yeah. and um you have to learn the technology which goes back to his whole his whole thing that he very much believed which was to you know um learning from the barbarians learning from the barbarians learning from their technologies yeah. and then use it against them mm-hmm. so he said that we should buy whatever we can buy from the west mostly military equipment wise mm-hmm. um so he named like you know we should buy ships we should buy cannons we should buy gunpowder anything they will sell us we should buy <laughs> he said <laughs> and um the Qing government should allow um even allow like these equipments to be used as a tax payments for the tea and the silk that we exported mm. so you know he's like if we don't have enough money let's just use this that'll fix the a- allow them to pay too. yeah right so um well, so he thought about it it's interesting though because it's like yeah that's what the mccartney expedition brought yeah right they brought all these guns and yeah. things we didn't and want it models. yeah <laughs> yeah so um we're like we have no use of this <laughs> these strange and exotic strange items. exotic items so then he also suggested that we should send people out to america france and portugal three countries to study ship making mm. you know so he did have i think it's funny he doesn't want to go to the uk maybe. no it's too soon. They're the, yeah they're, they're the enemy right at the moment right yeah. so like the other ones that are playing relatively nice right yeah so and, and in his you know he thought they had better technology than China. Mm-hmm. So we got to send people there. We're going to bring people back and we got to have a whole industry of shipmaking yeah. to build up the Navy. And I thought, you know, he really, so the first, let's just talk about the part that's not accurate, right? Yeah. The part that's not accurate is very troublesome, I thought, because he is supposedly the expert. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? He's a big time scholar. He wrote all these and edited all these like government collections of books. Yeah. Um, and, in the government, he is the voice for, and he's a historian as well. Yeah. So if his understanding of these things weren't even accurate, yeah. How, how do you think the government was doing overall <laughs> yeah. in the negotiations 
of the British and in their understandings of the enemy. Yeah. Right. They had, no, they had no idea. I'm sure the merchants in Canton, right, yeah. had ideas. I'm sure the the business associations of Canton <laughs> yeah. had better ideas. So that was obviously very troublesome to me. But then still, though, he did put into thoughts. He did put a lot of thoughts into these things, right? Yeah. You can see that he had a plan, which they could have executed, not to say the plan is perfect. Um, and he not only, obviously, he believes that the technology is very important, he does also mention the corruption. He does also mention a coherent, the need for a coherent strategy um, within the government and the military. It kind of sounds like the um, what would eventually become the self-strengthening movement in the 1860s, yeah. where they're like, well, let's keep all the Confucian stuff, but yeah, we need military academies and guns and factories and all that kind of stuff in order yes. to compete. Yes. And no, th- th- that definitely traces... I'm sorry out. I said the Confucian crap. I mean, <laughs> this wisdom. <laughs> I'm so offended. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, th- no, th- those that move, that uh, wave of movements and thoughts, yeah. I feel like it really came from, you know, you can draw, you can trace it back to yeah. where he started um, writing these books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and theories. There is a lack of... He doesn't go into the roots of the government structure. Yeah. And he doesn't go... It's a political problem. It's a problem of how we organize the government from the bottom up, right? Or top yeah. down. But it's, you know, I'm not sure he was in a position to even say that. Well, or I, if I, he thought of that, if he had said that, his head would be... No, the interesting you know. thing is, is like, you get this in a lot. I, I, I'm just There's this idea, mm-hmm. which is probably true in a broad sense of like, this Chinese imperial government system yeah. is perfect. Yeah. If everybody uh-huh. involved is honest yeah. and, and a righteous person. Yes. And as long as that's true, then um, then it's going to be great. And probably historically, that is true, right? There are periods of time where you have very competent... I mean, isn't system. that the same theory as if we always had a good dictator? Yeah, no, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. So the, the, the issue they always seem to think about is like, it's like, do we need to reform the system? It's like, no, how do we get more righteous yeah. officials, right? How yeah. do we get how do better we get, technology? How do we get right? better how do we get better dictators, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think even with him, there's no real concept of like, oh, maybe we need a different structure to get rid of this corruption. It's like, no, we just need yeah. more righteous. Yeah. And I officials. feel like there is a certain arrogancy to arrogancy? Arrogance. Arrogance to it, which is he in his attempt to write you know, all the, not an attempt, he did, yeah. right? Documents about the West and social structure. He talks about political structures. He, mm-hmm. he talked about elections, how elections worked in America, yeah. how, how they worked in England. So clearly he had a very pretty comprehensive, again, relatively speaking at the time, yeah. <laughs> comprehensive understanding of how a different government structure could work. Yeah. But no, the <laughs> celestial court is the best. <laughs> yeah. So, only if we didn't have these corrupt officials and uh, the soft softies yeah was in the court so so that was interesting and i feel like his thoughts are definitely very very influential and we can i I mean we can i almost think we should have a complete separate episode of it just to talk about well other books as well i I think it i think it is interesting though because you really the the views that get that get come down through history Mm -hmm. or even in the short term are basically the hardline views it's basically Lin Zushu's right. Yeah, we have to be stronger, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, you know that you know that the the problem is being too soft and negotiating with these people and not not putting our foot down. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's yeah, that's going to kind of well, nationalism it, loves it. Yeah, in the, the, the modern Chinese identity, of course, favors it. Yeah. Although there's the criticism of the party line. It's like, oh, he didn't think about, he didn't have a total revolution. <laughs> yeah. Unlike Mao, you know. But, but I mean, I guess yeah. the problem is, though, is that it's easy to say that. Of course, yeah. But clearly, the, the Chinese military and the government at the time did not have the, the strength to back that up. No. So it's all well and good. It's easy to say that. Yeah. That's what we got to do when they could have thought about it and couldn't do it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's easy to say we should have been firm, but mm-hmm. it's like well then well then what happens when the British start coming and burning everything down? Like yeah, well they didn't have the equipment. Yeah, which is why <laughs> he's like we gotta spend money on this crap. <laughs> we gotta buy more cannons. Yeah, buy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah, but it's it, yeah I agree though it, it's not as simple as the the Qing government was weak. It's not as black and white like that. Yeah. 
Um, well, I think uh, our next episode, we're going to talk about um, uh, one of the first, uh, or uh, the um, at the time, mm-hmm. if I recall, was the most expensive movie ever shot in China, which is the uh, account of the Opium Wars. Which was in interesting. The, in the 1990s, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. which we're going to watch and talk about. Yeah. Um, Movies from uh, movies from like '90s China, I think '80s, '90s China are very interesting because they're they haven't really figured out how they want to do the censorship yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they haven't really decided like what they're going to allow and what they're not going to allow. Right. So there's a lot of uh, we talk about like the blue kite and uh, to live and stuff where it's like they get made and they let things be produced and then they just like don't let the director make movies for a couple of years or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious to see what the narrative is in that. But mm-hmm. uh, in any case, uh, thank you for listening, everyone. We really appreciate it. And yeah, I think we've got some. We're finishing up. I guess this is sort of like a, a topic of the of opium in general. And uh, we're finishing. This is a very drug heavy <laughs> <drug-heavy>. uh, season. <laughs> season. And then uh, we're finishing up, and then we're gonna kind of, I guess, yeah, go into some more things. I'm excited for our episode. We're gonna do on on Judge D. Oh God, yeah. yeah. So Judge D for our Chinese listeners is uh, Di Gong, which you know, and you know, there's it's in it's in our pop culture. I didn't know who Judge D was, and then I looked it up and I was like, oh okay, of course I know who that who guy is. is. Yeah. So I'm sure you've heard of him. So yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to know more about him too. So if you enjoyed our episode, give us a review on Apple Podcast. Share it with your family and friends who might also enjoy history stories yeah about china and asian americans and uh we think we're wrong yeah you can write to us things to us on twitter or email (laughs) us um yeah so thank you for listening and have a nice day see you next time